On the silver screen, William Powell was the epitome of debonair sophistication and charm. Few Hollywood icons were able to live up to the characters they played on screen, but Powell was an exception. He was as dashing in real life as in the movies. However, while the facade rarely broke, his private life was dominated by tragedy and heartbreak. He lost two soulmates, a child, and survived a terrifying brush with grim death by gambling on a treatment that sounded more like a form of torture. And yet, in spite of all of this, the gentleman, as he was known, managed to find a sliver of happiness in later life. So how did he do it? Let's take a trip through the smoky, debonair, martini-infused world of William Powell. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries, episode eight. William Powell played the suave Nick Charles in the iconic detective duo with Myrna Lois Nora. The pair made matrimony look like the ultimate adventure in the Thin Man series of movies they starred in together. Their on-screen rapport was filled with stylish banter and warm, affectionate exchanges. They convinced audiences to the point where fans bombarded MGM with letters, asking for real-life marriage counseling from the two stars. The pair were as well suited to one another as Frank's vermouth and gin are suited for making one of the countless martinis they sipped on screen. But Powell's real relationships were another story, certainly more shaken than stirred. Born on July 29th in 1892, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, William Horatio Powell was the only child of Nettie Manila and Horatio Warren Powell, an accountant. The family moved to Kansas City in 1907, where William finished high school, immersing himself in dramatic arts and regularly attending vaudeville shows with his mother. Despite his parents' aspirations for him to harness his eloquent voice in a law career, William enrolled at the University of Kansas in 1911, only to leave a week later determined to carve out his path on the stage. Bill, as he was known, spent a year working at the Kansas City Telephone Company, trying to save up for drama school, but the money just wasn't enough for the tuition at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. That's when he thought of asking a well-off aunt for a loan. Thanks to her, by 1912, Bill had secured a spot at AADA, rubbing shoulders with the likes of Edward G. Robinson, and by the next year, he was a graduate. Then came a stretch of hustling for acting gigs. Bill graced the stage in numerous vaudeville productions and stock companies aiming to carve out a reputation in the theater world. It was during this grind in 1915 that he wed Eileen Wilson, originally Julia Mary Tierney, an actress on Broadway and touring shows throughout the 1920s. Together they welcomed a son, William David Powell, Bill's only child born in 1925. Seven years of treading the boards led to his cinematic break in 1922 with a role in Sherlock Holmes, cast as Professor Moriarty's sinister henchman. Powell's standout performance kicked off his journey in silent films, landing him a contract with Paramount. Throughout the 1920s, under Paramount's banner, and later with Warner Brothers, Powell became a familiar face in cinema. Over six years in silent film, starring in more than 30 movies, William shared the screen with the era's icons, like John Barrymore, Marion Davies, and Ronald Coleman, with whom he struck a deep friendship. He even appeared in 1922's blockbuster, when Knighthood was in flower, the highest budget movie of its time. Though he'd later capture hearts as the debonair, heroic detective, Nick Charles, in these early days, Powell was invariably cast as the villain. Before Nick, Powell made his name playing another well-known sleuth, Philo Vance, the astute detective created by S.S. Van Dyne was William Powell's first lead role in the Canary murder case in 1929. He portrayed Vance in four films for Paramount Pictures. As Powell's career flourished, his personal life, on the other hand, faced turmoil. He divorced Eileen in 1930. By then, at 38, Powell had achieved considerable success in the film industry. His stage training and distinctive voice made him a leading figure in the era of talkies and he was a prominent actor at Paramount. Despite his professional achievements, his marriage had long been strained, leading to a separation. Furthermore, he was living with his parents, not exactly in keeping with his romantic image. However, it was rumored that Powell maintained a bachelor pad under the pseudonym Mr. Thorne, duly decorated with a rather provocative collection of French art photography. Powell, 
alongside Ronald Coleman, Richard Barthelmas, Ernest Torrance, and Warner Baxter, were known as the notorious bachelors of 1920s Hollywood. Although their wildest days were somewhat behind them as they approached their 40s, they were still enjoying all the pleasures life as a wealthy Hollywood leading man would throw at them. That being said, they were more restrained than the infamous duo of David Niven and Errol Flynn, who resided together in the infamous Anglo-American house of debauchery, known as Cirrhosis by the Sea. During a 1930 trip through Europe with Coleman and Torrance, Powell observed, I was absolutely surrounded by playboys and playgirls of the play world. Everyone around me seemed to be having a most glorious time, yet I was, if possible, even more lonely than I had been at home. And so it was that he found himself ready to settle down. His choice of partner, however, may have been partially misguided. At 21, Carol Lombard was fiercely independent. She was already making her mark away from her mother's oversight. She adopted the name Carol Lombard in 1925 at the age of 15, finding her birth name Jane Peters uninspiring. Following a serious car accident at 17, Lombard pragmatically joined Max Sennett's Bathing Beauties to jumpstart her acting career. Her transition to Paramount came after Pathé collapsed, but she was still finding her unique style in film, working on defining her on-screen presence. Off-screen, Carol had already gained a reputation as a smart, witty woman with some serious salt-of-the-earth credentials, and not least her penchant for swearing like a sailor. 1931's Man of the World was a dramatic tale of a blackmailer who unexpectedly falls for one of his targets. The initial plan involved a straightforward professional meeting between prospective stars Lombard and Powell before the shooting would begin. Powell, already an established leading man, had little patience for inexperienced actresses. Lombard, however, was a determined young actress with a no-nonsense attitude and a very sharp tongue, showing she wasn't about to back down easily. It was deemed wise for them to meet and discuss the film's demands beforehand, and essentially to see if Lombard would please the film's leading man. Lombard, facing a pivotal moment in her career, might have been expected to be the anxious one in their meeting, yet Powell admitted feeling like a jittery teenager on a first date, concerned about making a positive impression on her. Powell explained, The day I met Carol, I had the same feeling as a 16-year-old boy on his first date. I was embarrassed and fidgety, I worried over whether or not I was making a good impression on her. It just so happened that immediately after our introduction, which took place at the studio, we were left alone to talk over the picture we were about to do together. But we didn't talk about the picture. We talked about men and women and things that happened to them, and ourselves. Their conversation flowed into an extended dinner date. Powell, needless to say, was convinced she was the right woman for the role. The studio, however, were prevaricating leading Powell to threaten to quit if they hired anyone other than Lombard. On the set of Man of the World, they were irresistibly drawn to each other. It was a classic case of opposites attracting. It was a dynamic that transcended the film's lackluster script and pedestrian direction, becoming the highlight of an otherwise uninspiring movie. Their rapport didn't fade with the final scene. They shared a wicked sense of humor. William Powell found Carol Lombard's risque jokes and bold language utterly delightful. Lombard in turn delighted in teasing Powell, affectionately dubbing him Junior, and as her career ascended, Mr. Carol Lombard. Seizing on the buzz around their off-screen romance, Paramount cast them together again in Ladies' Man, another middling film that failed to dazzle audiences despite the couple's palpable on-screen passion. Their lives at the time couldn't have been more different. Lombard, who was the life of any party, especially at the Coconut Grove, the legendarily lavish and sadly recently demolished nightclub at the Ambassador Hotel, contrasted sharply with Powell's more ordered lifestyle. Despite their differences, they were candid about their expectations for life. Powell admired Lombard's openness, calling her the most straightforward woman he'd ever met. Lombard, aware of their differing temperaments, joked about Powell's preference for order, saying that he will strangle me or at least want to. He likes order and dignity. I can't live that way. I always do whatever occurs to me at the moment. Yet Powell found himself swept up in the whirlwind of their budding romance, realizing during their initial encounter that Lombard was the woman he envisioned marrying someday. A thought that struck him as he conversed with what he called the most beautiful girl he had ever known. For their marriage to work, William and Carol had to compromise significantly. William wished for Carol to abandon her blossoming career, a notion she couldn't accept. Meanwhile, Carol's enthusiasm for nightlife was something William couldn't share. 
I think I asked Carol to marry me on average every half hour. At first, she was a bit dubious. So many professional marriages failed to work out. I had experienced one failure in matrimony previously, and Carol was just starting out on a career that was tremendously important to her, he said. Finding a middle ground was their only hope, but compromises are never long-term solutions. Nevertheless, on June 26, 1931, William and Carol wed. William expressed his newfound perspective on freedom. Freedom is one of the great disillusions of the world. I've had a great many years of the coveted freedom. I think I'm getting the most wonderful girl in the world. Freedom. I'd trade every bit of it just for a few hours with Carol. The wedding day brought its jitters, with William momentarily uncertain about which finger the ring belonged on. The newlywed set off for a Hawaiian honeymoon, which was anything but relaxing as Carol fell ill with the flu. Adjusting to married life, William did his utmost to support Carol's career while she strived to be the ideal wife he desired. In fact, it became a kind of game to her, a part of their constant banter. She was determined to be the best old-fashioned wife there ever was. It was during this time that Carol worked on No Man of Her Own, notable for its intense romantic scenes with Clark Gable, despite the on-screen connection that wowed audiences. Carol's affection remained with William, and Gable, though married to Rhea Langham, was in unrequited love with Elizabeth Allen. No man of her own stirred controversy, especially with its passionate scenes, attracting criticism from Father Daniel Lord, Hollywood's resident Jesuit priest, who questioned how William Powell could accept his wife's role in filthy movies. Powell didn't see what the fuss was about, but it is theorized that no man of her own was the straw that broke the camel's back when it came to establishing the Hayes Code. Lord was a significant party to drawing up the code after 1929. Two years into their marriage, Bill and Carol reached a mutual decision to part ways, despite their best efforts to adapt and accommodate each other's needs. Their attempts ended up feeling more confining than caring. Carol recognized the profound differences between them as husband and wife, foreseeing that these could only lead to conflict and bitterness. Opting for a decisive end rather than letting grievances accumulate to justify a divorce, she chose to act swiftly and end their marriage. Tears streaming down her face, Carol embraced Bill for the last time as his wife, yet in doing so, she preserved their bond as friends, declaring him the finest friend a woman could have. And they did indeed remain close friends, even finding the divorce process to be something of a laugh riot in the parlance of the era. Carol set off to Nevada to formalize their separation. Bill didn't challenge the divorce, and Carol didn't seek any financial support from him. The divorce proceedings revealed some of their private jokes. Carol humorously cited William Powell's pension for swearing as a factor in their split, a comment that sparked laughter in the courtroom, especially given Lombard's own notorious fondness for colorful language. With this being his second divorce, Powell found himself at a crucial juncture in his life, yet he was on the cusp of entering two significant relationships, one with a fictional character that would become iconic, and another deeply personal and ultimately heartbreakingly real. In an era when most movies concluded with the protagonists embarking on a life of wooded bliss, Powell and Loy, portraying Nick and Nora Charles, broke new ground. Their portrayal in The Thin Man and its sequels brought a fresh perspective on married life, characterized by undeniable chemistry. Powell famously remarked, even my friends never failed to tell me that the smartest thing I ever did was to marry Myrna Loy on the screen. I never saw Myrna go into a temperamental tantrum, rave and rant, or walk off the set in a huff. When we did a scene together, we forgot about the technique, camera angles, and the microphones. We weren't acting. We were just two people in perfect harmony. Their first movie together, Manhattan Melodrama, 1934, cast Powell and Clark Gable as childhood friends who take divergent paths, with Gable's character turning to a life of crime, and Powell becoming the district attorney and later governor, both vying for Loy's affection. Director Woody One Take Van Dyke, observing the natural chemistry between Powell and Loy off screen, insisted on casting Loy as Nora Charles opposite Powell, despite MGM's initial reservations about Loy's comedic abilities. Van Dyke's insistence paid off. This film was a canvas for Loy's natural comedic talent and cemented the duo's place in Hollywood history. Through Clark Gable, William Powell was introduced to Gable's so-called sister, none other than Jean Harlow, the most sensational star in Hollywood at the time. Known as the original blonde bombshell, Harlow's alluring appearance had a mesmerizing effect, sending men into a frenzy, 
and women rushing for the peroxide. Despite her critical view of her acting skills, one stating, I'm the worst actress that was ever in pictures. Her magnetic appeal was undeniable. Carla's critique of her own talent might have been a tad harsh. She certainly wasn't the poorest performer in the industry, nor was she the finest. However, her keen observational skills and dedication to learning from her peers saw her grow as an actress. Her roles in later movies, such as Wife vs. Secretary and Libel Lady, showed a marked improvement. Beyond her beauty, Harlow exuded a bold sexuality that was unmistakable. She famously didn't bother with undergarments, a choice that did not go unnoticed, especially when she appeared on set in sheer gowns, leaving very little to the imagination. Harlow wasn't initially aiming for stardom. She would have much rather pursued a career in writing, but her ambitious mother and the sway of circumstances directed her towards the glitz of Hollywood. Harlow found herself constantly under her mother's influence, which often led to feelings of insecurity. This perhaps explained her tendency towards relationships with older men. When she and Powell crossed paths, she was dealing with the loss of her second husband, MGM producer Paul Byrne, who was 22 years her senior, and had died in dramatic circumstances, which we'll tend to in another video. Immediately after Byrne, she was married to Harold Rawson, a cinematographer who was 17 years older than her. Between these marriages, Harlow also had her share of romances with men who, while closer to her age, were hardly the kind of boys you'd want to introduce to your mother. They included the notorious gangsters Bugsy Siegel and Abner Swillman, and the charismatic playboy boxer Max Baer. Despite the whirlwind of scandals surrounding her personal life, Harlow's career didn't suffer. By 1933, she had become MGM's leading lady, outshining other near-mythical screen goddesses like Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, and Norma Shearer. With Will Hayes gearing up to impose his moral code on Hollywood, the public couldn't seem to get enough of Harlow's brazen sexuality, soaking it up while they still had a chance. Behind the glamour and the spotlight, Harlow yearned for a simpler life far removed from Hollywood's dazzle, away from her domineering mother, dreaming of a large family. When she encountered Powell, their connection sparked instantly and intensely. Powell found himself deeply in love with Harlow, and the studio, recognizing the pair's genuine affection, began crafting films starring the two, moving Harlow on from her prior frequent collaboration with Clark Gable. Their romance seemed idyllic, with both stars poised to rake in significant earnings from MGM. Visions of retirement, tranquility, and family life appeared within reach, yet Powell, twice divorced, was hesitant to wed again. Despite Harlow's persuasion, he was haunted by his past marital experiences. He gifted her a lavish 150 carat sapphire ring, but remained steadfast in his decision not to marry. Having already experienced marriage to a young blonde sensation, Paul was wary of another potential split. Harlow's life at the time was still heavily influenced by her mother and stepfather. Despite her status as a leading lady in Hollywood, her stepfather managed her finances effectively controlling all of her life choices. For Powell to consider marriage, he faced the daunting task of liberating Harlow from her stepfather's stringent control. Having spent a significant portion of his career playing detectives, William Powell was no novice when it came to a bit of real life detective work. His investigation into Harlow's stepfather uncovered that he had recklessly blown all of her earnings on bad and absurd investments. This fact shocked Harlow and caused her to begin distancing herself from her stepfather and placing more trust in Powell in terms of her now massive earnings. Together, Powell and Harlow appeared in Reckless in 1935, marking Harlow's debut in a musical film. They teamed up again for two more movies in 1936, Riff Raff and Libeled Lady, alongside Powell's The Thin Man co-star, Erna Loy. Harlow and Loy hit it off brilliantly, while Libeled Lady also sparked a romance between its other star, Spencer Tracy and Loy. In January 1937, Harlow joined MGM colleague Robert Taylor in Washington, D.C. for fundraising events celebrating President Franklin D. Roosevelt's birthday, benefiting what would later be known as the March of Dimes, a nonprofit still in operation today, which supports the health of mothers and babies. A supporter of the Democratic Party, Harlow had previously campaigned for Roosevelt in the 1936 presidential election and for Upton Sinclair in California's 1934 governor race. Powell, who is a steadfast Republican, opted out of this particular journey. The Washington trip proved strenuous for Harlow, leading to her contracting influenza. The flu hit her hard, and she was already in a weakened physical state. 
In 1936, she had found herself pregnant with Powell's child. Harlow wanted the baby, despite knowing Powell's reluctance to become a father. Yet under her mother's influence and the fact that they were unmarried, she chose to have an abortion without informing Powell, a decision that weighed heavily on her both emotionally and physically. At the Oscars of 1937, alongside Powell, Clark Gable, and Carol Lombard, Harlow's illness was so severe that Lombard had to assist her to the powder room for a moment of respite. Jean Harlow's last movie, Saratoga, was on the docket for March 1937, but had to be pushed back due to Harlow facing a health scare from sepsis after getting her wisdom teeth removed. She ended up in the hospital but bounced back two months later, with filming kicking off on April 22, 1937. She also graced the cover of Life magazine on May 3rd, captured by legendary photographer Martin Kauchi in the last important photo shoot of her life. By May 20th, during the Saratoga shoot, Harlow started feeling under the weather. A particular scene required co-star Gable to lift her and toss her onto a couch, but he immediately sensed something was off. He noticed her pale, swollen face, labored breathing, and the sweat on her forehead. Gable gently placed her on the couch and called for a break. Despite Harlow's insistence she could continue, the studio's doctor sent her to get medical attention. The doctor diagnosing her with symptoms like tiredness, nausea, swelling, and stomach pain initially thought she had cholecystitis, and the flu. They were unaware of Harlow's previous year's battles with severe sunburn and flu. Her co-star, Una Merkel, was alarmed by Harlow's sudden weight gain and dull complexion. On May 29th, as Harlow was filming a feverish scene, her real condition worsened. She was, by this stage, sicker than the character she was playing. She leaned on Gable, gasping. I feel terrible. Get me back to my dressing room. She asked the assistant director to call Powell, who immediately rushed from his own film set to take her home. The following day, upon realizing Harlow's health hadn't improved, Powell reached out to her mother, known as Mama Jean, urging her to end her vacation early to tend to her daughter. This decision, though well-intentioned, turned out to be disastrously wrong. Powell also called for medical help. Given Harlow's history of health issues that had previously postponed the production of films like Wife vs. Secretary, Susie, and Libeled Lady, her latest sickness initially didn't raise alarms. By June 2nd, news circulated that she was battling another round of influenza. Dr. Ernest Fischbach, brought in to exam Harlow, believed her to be suffering from gallbladder inflammation. However, Harlow's mother's religious convictions barred any medical intervention, leading her to dismiss the healthcare professionals and forgo hospitalization for her daughter. Jean Harlow spent the next week bedridden, her blonde locks now arrayed wildly out on her pillow, amidst a chaos of silk sheets. Her mother pushed her to read Gone with the Wind, but those attempts were thwarted by her weakened state, barely able to flip through the page. Mama Jean assured MGM on June 3rd that Harlow was on the mend, setting expectations for her to return to filming by June 7th, 1937. Yet the media offered mixed messages, headlines switching between Jean Harlow seriously ill and Harlow recovers from illness crisis. Harlow's continued absence worried her colleagues, prompting Gable to pay her a visit. He later shared that Harlow appeared unusually swollen and noted the smell of urine on her breath when he kissed her, both indicative of kidney failure. Gable, it seems, was the only person to determine what was wrong with her. In spite of several medical professionals examining her and her mother's confidence that she was almost ready to return to work, Powell by this stage was increasingly concerned and agitated for her to see another doctor. Finally, Dr. Leland Chapman, a colleague of Fishbox's, was brought in for a second opinion on Harlow's deteriorating health. Chapman quickly determined that Harlow was not battling gallbladder inflammation, but was tragically in the advanced stages of kidney failure. On June 6, 1937, Harlow expressed difficulty in seeing Powell clearly, unable to discern the number of fingers he held up. It wasn't until the eighth day of her critical illness, after suffering through bouts of vomiting and delirium, that her mother consented to her admission to Good Samaritan Hospital. Before leaving, Mama Jean made sure her nursemaid packed her copy of Gone with the Wind, hoping she might finish the book during her stay. The nursemaid, however, remarked, she'll never finish it, a prophecy that would sadly ring true. That very night, Harlow fell into a coma and passed away the following morning at 11.37 a.m. at the age of 26. The official cause of death was reported as cerebral edema, stemming from her kidney failure. In a desperate attempt to alleviate her condition, Doctors had shaved off Harlow's iconic peroxide blonde hair, hoping to reduce toxins and fluid in her body. Powell was left shattered by her death, 
overwhelmed with sorrow and guilt for not recognizing the severity of her condition earlier. Though realistically, medical treatments for kidney failure in 1937 were severely limited. At Harlow's funeral, Paul was visibly distraught. As you can see in this image, fists clenched in pain, needing the support of his mother and screenwriter Otis Wiles just to stand. Such was the depth of his grief. Carol Lombard was also present, as ever an emotional support for Bill. MGM orchestrated a grand funeral for Jean Harlow, and Powell ensured she was laid to rest in a magnificent crypt at Forest Lawn. She was buried in one of her breathtaking gowns from Libeled Lady. Reportedly, a solitary white gardenia was placed inside her coffin, accompanied by a note from Powell that said, Good night, my dearest darling. Her tombstone carries a simple inscription, Our Baby. Harlow's passing marked the onset of an incredibly tough period for Powell, filled with both emotional and physical trials. Her absence plunged him into deep depression, a struggle he had encountered before. Powell, who confided in Loy, once remarked, people don't know it, but I'm primarily Irish. We get these dark periods. Overwhelmed by grief, Powell found himself unable to attend the premiere of Harlow's last movie, Saratoga. In search of solace, he embarked on a journey to Europe aboard a steamship, hoping to heal his shattered spirit. In the aftermath of her departure, Powell sought refuge on Ronald Coleman's yacht for some time before his grief manifested physically, causing him to collapse on the set of Double Wedding. This incident forced him to step away and take additional time to recover. However, these incidents were not entirely psychosomatic, and Powell sought a medical opinion on his own physical health. Speculation about William Powell's health issues began to circulate, with rumors suggesting he was battling unspecified intestinal troubles or perhaps appendicitis. Eventually, MGM disclosed that Powell was dealing with cancer, specifically naming it as colon cancer, rather than revealing it to be rectal cancer. At the time, any cancer diagnosis was profoundly serious, given the rudimentary nature of treatments compared to modern standards. Surgery and the potential need for a lifelong colostomy bag were the usual course of action for rectal cancer. Powell later commented on the discomfort and unease of his condition, the worst thing about the situation was the aesthetics of it, he said. Unwilling to resign himself to living with a colostomy bag, Powell consented to a pioneering treatment approach. This involved the implantation of platinum needles containing radium pellets into the affected area, a novel and rather terrifying method at the time. While awaiting the outcomes of this innovative treatment, Powell dedicated himself to a period of recuperation. His recovery efforts were twofold, aimed not only at conquering the cancer, but also healing from the profound grief of losing his beloved. Remarkably, within less than two years of undergoing this treatment with radioactive pellets, Powell experienced complete remission from his cancer. He acknowledged that he was one of the very lucky few to experience such an outcome. After stepping away from the limelight for two years, Powell wasn't quite ready to jump back into acting, despite his health showing signs of improvement, to take his mind off of his lingering depression. He traveled to Italy in the late 1930s. There, an encounter that would leave a lasting impression happened when a young boy, dressed in rags, ran by excitedly shouting to his friends. An Italian bystander explained to Powell that the boy was overjoyed because William Powell always made him laugh very much at the cinema. This moment offered William a much-needed uplift, reminding him that his acting career was more than just a job. It brought happiness to others. Throughout this challenging period, Paul had unwavering support of his ex-wife, Carol Lombard. She was always there to offer straightforward advice, often peppered with her characteristic frankness and creative swearing, helping to lift his spirits. By 1939, Paul was ready to make his comeback, reuniting with Myrna Loy in Another Thin Man, both mentally and physically rejuvenated. That same year, during a photo shoot at his home by the pool, organized by the studio, Paul met Deanna Lewis, a young MGM contract player who was modeling that day. Lewis, who had a background in vaudeville, viewed acting more as a profession than a path to stardom, contrasting with Lombard and Harlow's ambitions. Paul and Lewis quickly fell in love. Lawyer remarked that despite their significant age difference, Powell at 47 and Lewis at 21, friend's skepticism was unfounded. Lewis, affectionately known as Mousy, would be a devoted partner to Powell for over four decades. He was mad about her, Loy observed. Just when it seemed Powell's fortunes were improving, fate still had more in store for him. His trials and tragedies were far from over. During World War II, Carol Lombard headed back to her native Indiana 
for a war-bound rally, accompanied by her mother and Clark Gable's publicist, Odo Winkler. And one night, she impressively gathered over two million in defense bonds. The original plan was to return to Los Angeles by train, but Lombard was eager to get home sooner and pushed for a flight instead. Her mother and Winkler, both fearful of flying, preferred sticking to the train plan, but Lombard got her way. In the wee hours of January 16th, 1942, Lombard, her mother, and Winkler boarded a transcontinental and Western Air Douglas Sleeper transport for their trip back to California. After stopping for fuel in Las Vegas, TWA Flight 3 resumed its journey at 7.07 p.m., only to meet a terrible fate by crashing into Double Up Peak near Potosi Mountain, roughly 32 miles southwest of Las Vegas. The crash claimed the lives of all 22 passengers, including Lombard, her mother, Winkler, and 15 U.S. Army soldiers. Lombard was just 33 years old. The tragedy was later attributed to the flight crew's error in navigating the mountainous terrain around Las Vegas. Complicating matters, the usual safety beacons guiding night flights had been deactivated to avoid aiding potential enemy Japanese bombers, leaving the pilot and crew without essential visual cues to avoid the mountains. On the night of the crash, William and Mousy received a heart-wrenching call informing them of Lombard's involvement in the fatal accident. The Powells spent the entire night awaiting further news, holding on to hope for their dear friend. Ultimately, they were informed that Lombard had perished in the crash. Losing Lombard, his close friend of over a decade, plunged William Powell into deep mourning once again. After his memorable partnership with Loy, Powell starred in a string of distinguished films through the 1940s, including the whimsical Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid in 1948 with Anne Blythe and put forth a passionate effort to secure the role of the blustering Clarence Day in Life with Father in 1948, earning him an Academy Award nomination. He stepped into the shoes originally filled by Lionel Barrymore for the remake of A Free Soul, rebranded as The Girl Who Had Everything, and took a supporting role in How to Marry a Millionaire, alongside Lauren Bacall, Betty Grable, and Marilyn Monroe. Yet one of his most celebrated roles was on the horizon. In 1955, Powell brought to life the sage, experienced Doc, and Mr. Roberts, alongside an impeccable cast that included Henry Fonda, James Cagney, and Jack Lemmon, with the movie being filmed in Hawaii. Lemmon fondly recalled Powell as the cast-nurturing figure, always ready with snacks and a tidy space. Cagney admired Powell's theatrical anecdotes, and was yet another who noted that Powell's sophistication wasn't just for the cameras. This role was Powell's grand finale in film, exiting the stage as Doc, and a performance that was a high note in his career. Hollywood had taken its toll on Powell. The demanding schedule of on-location shooting proved too much. Myrna Loy asked him if he was sure he wanted to retire. Powell responded, Minnie, I wouldn't even groom my mustache again, much less learn a movie role. Although he never shared the screen with Loy again, or anyone else for that matter, he continued the tradition of sending roses on every opening night of her shows. For Powell, it was time to embrace the quieter life he had always dreamed of. Retirement followed, spanning nearly three decades. Powell and Mousy settled in Palm Springs, where they spent the twilight years of his life. Yet 1968 brought another wave of sorrow, the loss of Powell's only son, William Davis Powell, his child with Eileen, his first wife. He was a talented scriptwriter and assistant producer, but William Jr.'s health had declined following a diagnosis of hepatitis and kidney issues, leading him to bring an end to his own life. He left behind a four-page letter for his father, the contents of which remained private, except for the haunting final words, things aren't too good down here, I'm going where it's better. This loss shattered Powell, but he found strength to recover with Mousy's unwavering support by his side. It seems worth noting that there's barely a photograph of Mousy in existence, in which she's not laughing or smiling wholeheartedly, and Pyle is often caught in the same candid joy whenever in her presence. She was no doubt the secret to his ability to recover from his various tragedies, and ended up living a longer life than at one time he might have imagined possible. During a visit to Powell in Palm Springs, Loy asked how he spent his days. I do my weeds, he humorously responded. Loy retorted, for God's sake, Bill, you don't know one weed from another. Powell's comeback, well, it beats playing Elvis Presley's grandfather. This shows his class endured to the end, and he knew when it was time to gracefully depart from the silver screen. As Powell neared his 90th birthday, 
he faced a diabetes diagnosis, and his general health gradually worsened. On March 5, 1984, he passed away from pneumonia in Palm Springs and was laid to rest next to his son in Desert Memorial Park, Cathedral City, California. In 1997, Mousy passed away and was buried in the same spot. Myrna Loy captured his essence perfectly after his passing. I never enjoyed my work more than when I worked with William Powell. He was a brilliant actor, a delightful companion, a great friend, and above all, a true gentleman. That concludes this episode of Hollywood Mysteries. If you would like more rainy tales from the dark side of Tinseltown, feel free to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, it's good night from Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams.